Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, November 1st, 2018. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Dr. Chris Hamilton from Hillsdale College in Michigan joins us to talk about his experiments looking at the effect that wort gravity and hop stand temperature have on IBUs. Chris also follows up on the experiment that originally brought him to Basic Brewing Radio, using Clarity Firm to reduce the gluten levels in beer. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other Basic Brewing gear, including our tie-dye silicone pint. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Basic Brewing, and find our show page on Facebook. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you'd do us a favor of rating us on iTunes and maybe leaving a nice comment there, they say that that will help new listeners to find us. If you want to support us financially, check out Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing. And thanks to all the new subscribers who are helping out. If you go to Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing, you can see a, a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. The Halloween video episode featuring my booberry tart ale is out there. I shared a pint of it with my son Drew last night, and he liked it. Uh, I don't want to spoil the episode too much, but the beer did turn out better than I expected. It's <laughs> it's still a little weird, which is fine. It's great for Halloween. Uh, I'm wondering what to do for next year's Halloween beer. I saw a limited edition box of a Captain Crunch Halloween-themed cereal, so I may have to try to snag one of those. Uh, the Count Chocula that I used for last year's beer was a year old, and it didn't suffer from any uh, age on that. So uh, if you have any ideas for weird Halloween beers that uh, might also be tasty, please let me know. Um on a sadder note, I received some sad news from Tony Funk up in uh, the uh, Kansas City area. He sends us the news that Alberta Rager, owner and manager of Bacchus and Barleycorn, died this past Friday, October 26th. After retiring from teaching special education and mainstream elementary students, she began a second career teaching adults to brew beer, make wine, cider, mead, and cheese. She served as co-administrator of the fledgling Beer Judge Certification Program until it became an independent entity, and she was a member of the Board of Advisors of the American Homebrewers Association. And we met Alberta and interviewed her for this podcast way back in 2007 when we went up to uh, cover a competition being hosted by the Kansas City Beer Meisters. Very sad to hear of her passing. Um, By the way, Alberta's husband, Jackie, is author of the Rager IBU formula. Uh, So our our thoughts go out to him, all of Alberta's family, friends, and fellow brewers. And uh, I still have a pint glass from that competition, and I will raise it this evening in Alberta's honor. So thanks, thanks to Tony for letting me know. On to better news. I got some good comments on last week's show featuring the experiment that Alex Roberts and I did on wort chiller water flow. Brandon from Easley, South Carolina writes, What I began doing because my tap water won't chill below 88 degrees Fahrenheit. I got a cheap submersible water pump, a 30-gallon trash can full of ice. We have lots of those 20-pound $1 places here. And my immersion chiller. I pump the ice water through the chiller and collect it in a separate trash can to use on another batch if I'm brewing on the same day or for something else. I usually get my wort chilled down to about 60 degrees Fahrenheit in about 20 minutes, and it only takes about half of the trash can of water to do it. And P.S. Brandon says, uh, I wasn't paying attention one time and chilled my wort to 45 degrees Fahrenheit before I checked it. (laughs) Oops. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, Neil from Ames, Iowa writes, As a frugal brewer, I've tried several things to chill my work quickly, but without using a large amount of water. I'm also something of a traditionalist, so I don't use any pumps, gravity only. I even once built a counterflow chiller, but after trying to use it a couple of times and measuring how much water I used, over 60 gallons, I gave it up and went back to my tried-and-true method. Uh... Neil says, uh, my tried-and-true method is to save ice from my home ice maker every evening for a week 
And when I'm ready to chill my wort, I fill a six-gallon pot with ice, then fill it with water. I then just set it somewhere higher than my brew kettle, get the water siphoning through the chiller and into a pot on the ground, and stir the wort almost constantly, occasionally topping up the pot of ice water. It rarely takes more than half an hour to take the wort from close to boiling to below 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and I only use about 10 to 12 gallons of water. Wow. Uh, Neil says, I really think that stirring constantly helps rather than only a few stirs every five minutes and putting colder water through the chiller makes a large difference, too. Well, thanks, Neil. Alex and I really are going to have to follow up on that stirring thing, the stirring question. Um, I was I was surprised by the result that we found. John writes in with this. Hey, James and Steve, just dropping you a little note to say I purchased my brew in a bag system from High Gravity. It should be here within a couple days. Appreciate the information and reviews y'all did on it. Can't wait to get it and start brewing. Congratulations, John. I know you'll enjoy your system as much as I like mine from our friends and sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa. I'm hearing more and more from brewers who are taking the pain out of propane and going electric with a high gravity system with a warthog controller, especially as the weather turns colder. You don't want to have to stand out by the brew pot or, or mash ton 100% of the time babysitting it. Uh, the uh, Warthog controller takes the worry and guesswork out of hitting and maintaining mash temps. And when it comes time to boil, the, all the heat from the element goes right into the wort instead of blowing away with a breeze. And uh, the past two batches I've used with my system, uh, I, I did sort of a sous vide sort of thing. For the blueberry tart ale, I inoculated my wort with uh, probiotics and then held it at 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 43C for two days while it soured. Uh, and uh, for the latest experiment with Imperial's Loki yeast, I held a, a six and a half gallon carboy at 90 Fahrenheit or 32C during primary fermentation. So ease of use, flexibility, portability, What's not to like? Check out all the electric systems from two to three vessels and five gallons to two barrels at HighGravityBrew.com and use the code EBC75BB to save 75 bucks off your electric gear purchase. That's HighGravityBrew.com. Okay, you'll remember Chris Hamilton from his experiments with Clarity Firm and its effects on reducing gluten in beer. Well, now Chris is back to share experiments on IBUs in wort as they are affected by wort gravity and hop stand temperature. So if you want to follow along, find a link to his PDF in the description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com or by tapping the bonus button in your Basic Brewing app. Chris Hamilton, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hi, James. Good talking with you again. I can't even remember when we uh, when we last met. It's a, f- a few years ago. Yeah, it was at the uh, when the uh, American Homebrewers Association meeting was uh, in Grand Rapids, and we uh, met in a lovely hotel room. Yeah. <laughs> and your experiment that you shared with us then was on uh, the effect of Clarity Firm on gluten in beer, and I have to say that that was one of the most uh, Im- impactful. Uh, experiments, or at least influential experiments. Mm-hmm. Uh, several people have been impacted by your results. Uh, <laughs> in a good I hope way. Not. Uh, anyway, <laughs> in a good way. It's not always good to be impacted, but you know. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but uh, but but really, the the you know the results of that experiment uh, have made uh, you know some positive uh, impacts mm-hmm. on on brewing, uh, both on the yeah. professional and and homebrew scale. Yeah, it's good to see. And, uh, you know, after your show, I, we did the stuff on uh, beerandwinejournal.com, too, and that was uh, been read a lot. And uh, I know we've talked by initially by email a lot, and I've gotten a lot of emails about that uh, since. And so we've actually carried on some of that research, too, uh, over the years. And I can tell you a little bit about that if you're interested. Yeah, let's get an update. So uh, so if you, uh, so for people that haven't heard the show, but is about, you know, using Clarity Firm, uh, which is also as Brewers Clarex. Uh, and, you know, using that to break down uh, gluten in beer to essentially make a beer with very reduced gluten, you know, something close to gluten free or as close as you can get using um, barley or wheat. Uh, and so our results, you know, then you guys did the tasting on the show and uh, the experimental results that we did 
uh, showed that the beer essentially had, you know, undetectable levels of the little uh, proteins that are left over from gluten. Essentially, the way the enzyme works is by chopping up into little tiny pieces so that some of those pieces are still left over. But the idea is that they won't cause a problem to someone who has celiac disease. And so um, one thing that was really interesting is I've had some students uh, continue that work. And uh, one thing was kind of one of these accidental findings. Uh, I had a student, we wanted to use a different yeast. And so we saw these mangrove jack yeast came out a few years ago in the U.S. market. And we tried those and actually had the results weren't as, you know, pretty. I mean, everything was still reduced, uh, but it was a little bit higher. You know, some of the things were above the 20 parts per million uh, mm -hmm. level. We could detect it. And, you know, looking at the beer, I could clearly tell that the yeast uh, was still in suspension. Uh, it had it didn't flocculate nearly as much. And we intentionally don't use any fining agents uh, because we want the enzyme, you know, we don't want to like uh, bias it in any sort of way. We want just the enzyme to be doing things. And so we thought, well, maybe the yeast uh, flocculation is playing a role. And so uh, this past summer, when my students, uh, who also did some of the hop work we'll talk about later, uh, we actually used yeast with different levels of flocculation. And we found that the yeast that is, you know, the really high flocculators, we essentially got, you know, undetectable levels of gluten again. But in the yeast that, you know, we tried to have in yeast, you know, that actually, again, it had very reduced levels of gluten, but it was it was more detectable. Hmm. So, uh, you know, again, you know, we've got to repeat some of these experiments, but the evidence certainly seems, you know, if you're if you're trying to do this to reduce gluten uh, because, you know, you're someone with celiac disease that can tolerate uh, these gluten, you know, reduced beers uh, that, you know, you, you probably want to be using uh, a yeast that has higher flocculation. But again, you know, if you're using things like, you know, uh, Irish moss or roll flock, if you're using gelatin and all these to clarify your beers, then it's probably not as important. Uh, but uh, our hypothesis is that, you know, you know, yeast are known to bind to a lot of things. And probably the yeast are binding to some of the proteins that are in the beer. And, you know, gluten and the barley cordines, these are proteins. And so we, we think what might be happening is since they're binding to the yeast, that it's not accessible for the enzyme to break them down. So either by, you know, by clearing your beer and getting rid of the yeast, you're helping reduce the um, the amount of uh, gluten or hoarding um, that's that's in the beer. Uh, so, either you know using a higher flocking yeast or using fining agents to kind of cut those down. I was going to ask what impact uh, that would have on hazy beers, but I guess with hazy beers, you're probably not going to be using Clarity Firm because you want them hazy. Right. I mean, well. It depends. And, you know, the thing is, you know, Clarity Firm is really designed to, I mean, the initial reason for it uh, was to, you know, get rid of chill haze. It wasn't meant to be a fining agent like, you know, Whirl Flock is or like uh, some of these other products are, uh, even like Isinglass. It's it's doing a different sort of thing. Uh, so I think a lot of people, you know, don't know what it was originally for. It's like if you had a, like a hazy IPA recipe and had a Clarity Firm, it's still going to be a hazy beer. Uh, because But... Uh, you know, whatever the yeast is doing um, in your hazy beer, that's a different story uh, and something that we're still trying to work out exactly what's going on. So for those still not brewing, uh, like the zero tolerance guys uh, or the mm -hmm. ga guys and gals uh, from that uh, home brewing club, they're brewing uh, gluten free beers with uh, no gluten in right. their ingredient list at all. But for those who are still brewing, uh, you know, typical beers, traditional beers, and then wanting them to be as uh, gluten-free as possible for their uh, the people that they're serving, uh, having a more flocculent uh, yeast sounds like the way to go. Yeah, I would I would definitely recommend that, and certainly you know use your fighting agents, use rural flock or Irish moss or something like that as well. Uh, again, using the enzyme. It should, you know, chew up most of the proteins. But again, you know, 99.9% is is good enough for, for most people with, you know, uh, that have the gluten dis, uh, intolerance. But, you know, for some people, they are really hypersensitive to them. So I think, you know, the zero tolerance guys, for some people, if they want beer, that's all they can do. Uh, but I know a lot of people that, that do have celiac disease, uh, like my mother-in-law, you know, they, they cheat occasionally. They'll have birthday cake and they'll be, you know, you know, that kind of. Uh, thing and they're they're okay, uh, but some people you know they have a single like you know grain of gluten and you know they have a severe reaction. So mm. uh, I think for for those kind of people, the zero tolerance stuff they're doing is right along the right lines. But I think most you know I'm not a medical doctor, so don't take this as a prescription. Uh, but I think <laughs> you know if 
people that have celiac disease certainly should be working with their doctors. Um, I've heard people have talked to their doctors and a lot of them have given them the go ahead to either you know, for home brewing or to drink some of those uh, omission uh, beers that are on the market or the stone, um, they're kind of reduced gluten beer. And, you know, as long as you're not drinking a keg of it a day, uh, they're not having uh, kind of side effects from that. I, I think the alcohol might be a bigger problem with a keg a day. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there may be other issues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have no liver left. You know. yeah. yeah. As we as we talked about in the uh, uh, it, it, with the the toxicologist Paul episodes, uh, you know, the, there is something toxic in beer and it's ethanol. It's the, yeah. <laughs> so keep that in mind. <laughs> well, very nice. Um, are you ready to talk about hops and IBUs? Sure. Now you, you recently attended a, a an, an event uh, yes. and, and uh, actually presented at the event. Where'd you go? I What'd did. you do? So I went to the uh, European Brewing Convention, uh, their uh, recent advances in hop science symposium, uh, which was in September. Uh, it was actually in, uh, primarily in Nuremberg, Germany. Uh, mm-hmm. So I got to present some work there that one of my students uh, named Chris Huffman uh, did with me this past year. Uh, and so we were looking, primarily looking at you know hops uh, and looking at the effect on IBU utilization. Uh, look, looking at changes in gravity of the beer as well as changes in the temperature. And uh, before we get to your results, what what was the buzz around the uh, around the conference this year? You know, there were a lot of people really interested in you know bitterness units, especially related to hazy IPAs. Uh, my talk uh, was that was one of the motivating factors for my work was you know Newland IPAs, which I love as a style uh, and the flavor from the hops. But how does that bitterness work in? And so there were several talks um, related to that. Uh, so uh, actually, John Lanzini, uh, who does uh, Schilling Brewery, uh, he gave a great talk, and I got to talk to him quite a bit about that. And uh, Tom Shellhammer, which is a name some people might recognize from Oregon State, uh, he gave a nice talk, as well as a few of his uh, students as well. Uh, and there was uh, some interesting work, too, uh, from one of his students on, on dry hopping uh, and something that a lot of people had seen before. Uh, but uh, enzymes in the hops actually have amylase activity and uh, kind of tied in with some of John Lanzini's work, too, that they actually saw a decrease in the gravity of the beers that were dry hopped versus those that weren't. And so they were actually getting, you know, a little bit more alcohol out of those beers. And so that was some really cool stuff. Uh, and then there was also a lot of interest, especially um, on the second day about hop breeding and kind of, you know, all the hop breeding that's going on in Europe and kind of the influences there, uh, both... Uh, we're worried about like uh, verticillium and kind of resistance to that, as well as with, you know, potential climate change. They've been having a lot of droughts and intense heat um, in parts of Europe. So how can they breed hops to kind of combat some of those issues? And mm-hmm. so it was it was a great conference overall. And uh, we had a, a lot of fun and we got to go see a, a hop yard in Schwalt and got to see um, actually harvesting uh, hops because we were there at just the right time of the year for that. Oh, nice. Somebody must have somebody must have been planning ahead when they came up with the date for the conference. So. <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's fun. I've I've seen the hops harvested uh, a couple of times, and it's mm-hmm. it's amazing. You you don't you don't realize how how big and tall those uh, you know those vines can get. Yeah, it's it was it was it was a lot of fun, and everybody's standing around watching it. And of course, you know they had some good uh, German beer for us to drink while we watched them harvest hops. So it was, it was a lovely evening. There's, there's no good beer in Germany. Is there? I, I... <laughs> <laughs> there's a few, you know, if you know where to look, you know, they're just getting like started. Every restaurant, every grocery store, you know, every bar. Oh yeah. I'm, je- I'm jealous. I'm jealous, Chris. Uh, well, uh, well, let's talk about what you did. You, mm-hmm. you, you covered two areas. Uh, first of all, uh, the the effect on gravity uh, mm-hmm. of uh, the wort on IBU uh, utilization or hop utilization. So, right. what what was your methodology? How did you figure this stuff out? So, uh, yeah, the big experiment. Essentially, uh, what we did is we brewed a lot of beer, uh, but we did it on a small volume. And so, since we were doing so many samples, uh, we did basically effectively one liter batches of beer. Uh, and so, and we wanted to do this uh, with different hops, and we wanted to do it at different gravities. So, uh, for the uh, for the first of experiments looking at gravity, we actually did 64 separate batches of beer. Uh, we would do like four at a time, but that was still a lot of uh, brewing going on. Um, and so, to simplify things, we didn't do all grain. 
we used the same uh, brand of uh, uh, Mutton's uh, dried malt extract uh, to make up our our worts for the our, our beer. And we didn't actually ferment anything. That's something I should point out too, is we're looking just at the wort. Uh, and uh, that's important because when we're talking about bitterness later on, that's a little bit different than uh, most people are thinking about. Uh, so for the, for the gravity work, uh, we did four different gravities. And so we made beer that was, uh, we did it in Plato, uh, but I'll give you the conversions in a little bit. Uh, we're going to do Plato because that's where most of the brewing science is. And it was in talk within Germany as well, which is what everybody over there is using. So we did the beer, the, the wort gravity at five Plato, 10 Plato. The goal was to get to 15 and 20 Plato. We didn't quite hit those. Uh, but the idea was to give us a wide range of gravities. And for those of you know, you don't you aren't used to the Plato scale. A five Plato uh, word is about you know ten twenty, uh, and a, a ten Plato would be about ten forty. Uh, it's not quite linear. Uh, Fifteen Plato is about ten sixty one, and twenty Plato is about uh, ten eighty three. Uh, one thing I should say is that was our goal when we started out, and so we would we calculated the amount of dried malt extract we'd have to add to water. Uh, we, we did we ended up boiling these all for two hours. Mm. And so uh, because we wanted to do because a lot of people will do a two hour boil to try to get you know better hop utilization. And so we had to kind of, you know, figure out how much boil off we were going to get. And so we based our boil off experiments on like, you know, the five Plato, 10 Plato uh, words. And, you know, for those, we hit those pretty dead on. We knew, OK, it takes about uh, we start off with about, you know, one point four or five liters of water at our dried malt extract. And then we get to after two hours, get to one liter. Uh, well, we did those same calculations for the 15 and 20 Plato, but we actually didn't get as much boil off. Uh, you know, should have thought ahead. Oh, it's a much thicker solution, so it's actually going to boil off more slowly because hmm. uh, there's more sugar present. Uh, but in the end, it just didn't matter that much because okay, we had a 14.5 Plato war and a 17.5 Plato war. Those numbers are just as good to use for analysis as 5, 10, 15, and 20. Uh, they just you know don't have the nice round you know effects to them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what we ended up doing is uh, we chose two different hops for these experiments. So we had those four gravities and we brewed everything um, in duplicate. Uh, and we used both uh, uh, Cascade hops and Citra hops. Uh, so we wanted to use hops that had kind of different uh, alpha acid percentages. Uh, and so the Cascade hops, I, I'm thinking were around seven, seven or eight percent alpha acids. And the citras were uh, just over 13% alpha acids. Uh, and so what we did then, uh, and slow me down if I, I'm missing some details for you, but uh, what we did is we would do an individual gravity. And so if we wanted to do our five Plato beers that day, we would do four or five Plato beers, and we would add different amounts of a single hop to them. So our one, we'd add half a gram of hops to, and then one gram of hops, and then two grams of hops, and then three grams of hops. And we'd have those four beers uh, going that day or uh, that part of the day. Um, and then we'd repeat that with, you know, the, so we do it twice with Cascade at that gravity, repeat that twice with Citra at that gravity and repeat that. And then we would do all the other uh, the gravities of the beer. Uh, and so that's obviously a lot of beer. And you think about 64 different beers for that. Well, the important thing, you know, how are we going to test the hop utilization? Uh, so what we did is I'm going to do IBU analysis, and I, you've had several people on before that have talked about this. Uh, but we wanted to really follow, you know, what, you know, how quickly do things happen? I mean, there's a lot of questions. Pe most people, if your listeners are probably familiar with like the Tinseth formula. Uh, there's also the Rager and a few other ones, and uh, you know, a lot of these formulas are you know 20, 30 years old, uh, and they weren't done using pellet hops, which is what we were using, and. That was one of the questions is, you know, how do our how does our data fit with what the tin formula is? Uh, and so, uh, you know, it, so using pellet hops for this, I think, you know, kind of filled in some of that. And the goal was, do we see the same kind of thing? And so we took uh, time points throughout that entire two hours. So we took a time point literally one minute after we added the hops, five minutes after we added the hops, 10 minutes after we added the hops. And then, you know, every 10 minutes up through an hour in 60 minutes and then 75, 90, 105 and 120 minutes. So we got, you know, 13 time points for basically every single one. And, you know, you can do the math, multiply 13 times 64. We did a lot of IBU analysis this past summer uh, <laughs> doing this. Uh, and so, you know, one sort of, you know, 
initial finding we thought that was kind of surprising uh, was that we ended up seeing um, the IBU numbers were much higher than we initially expected uh, based upon what we'd seen with the TENSA formula, but also the initial rate. You know, we saw uh, I, the rate within five or 10 minutes, there were significant detectable IBUs in these wart samples. Uh, and that really, by the time we got to 40, 50 minutes, you know, we were close to the top uh, of, you know, where our IBUs would be. Um, and so by two hours, you know, the change wasn't that different. Uh, and, you know, uh, one thing of talking with uh, Tom Shellhammer at the, um, the ABC Hop conference uh, was that uh, his thought was that it's possible, and again, we have to do the experiment here, that uh, when you're doing this, you know, we didn't use any sort of, you know, hop spider or anything like that. We just threw the pellets in. And for those of your listeners who've used hop pellets, you know that pretty much it just, you know, turns into like dust when as soon as you add it and it's just, you know, kind of all over the place uh, in the wort when it's boiling. And so, you know, compared to hot cone, you are going to have a lot more surface area. If you would expect a faster uh, conversion from alpha acids to iso alpha acids um, in the beer or in the wort, but it still was, you know, that didn't explain the whole thing. And so he thought that maybe what's happening is even though we, we would pull our samples out using a pipette out of every, for every time sample, and we would take about six mils out and we'd immediately put it into a tube and ice it. And they were pre-chilled tubes. The idea is we want to lower the temperature to be, you know, as close to zero degrees Celsius as we can, as quickly as we can. And, you know, probably within, you know, within like maybe two minutes, you know, that the, those samples were cold. Mm -hmm. And then we would throw them in the fridge after that. Uh, so that the, the idea that, you know, there might be a little bit of a lag with the temperature, but it dropped really quickly. Uh, you know, his thought was, even though we were doing that, is, is that there might be some really fine particulate hops that are still suspended in solution, which might uh, be, ex you know, like, well, you're not going to convert any um, anything to iso alpha acids at that point. Uh, but something I learned uh, from John Lanzini was that, you know, when you're dry hopping, you actually, dec your IBUs in your beer stay about the same, but the iso alpha acids in the beer actually drop, and the alpha acids that are dissolved actually go up. So alpha acids were actually, it were interestingly, were a little bit more soluble in this, these cold temperatures. And so that maybe we're seeing a little bit of that going on um, mm -hmm. over time. So uh, we definitely need to look at, uh, you know, maybe possibly doing some filtration and seeing, does that give us a difference? Um, yeah, I'm looking so, at this chart, and uh, I'll post uh, a link to your PowerPoint presentation in the description of this episode mm -hmm. on basicbrewingradio.com. And uh, if you have the app, uh, you can click on the little bonus thing uh, button there uh, on this episode and, and find it. But if you look at this chart that says E1, time versus total IBU, uh, yeah, the, the level of bitterness jumps up. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it jumps up and is a flat line, like within what, 15 minutes? I can't use... I mean, it, yeah, it, it gets up there, you know, really quick. I mean, the uh, depending on which one you're looking at, really by yeah, maybe 20 minutes, the increase is really slow mm -hmm. uh, after that point. Uh, I, you know, really in most cases by about 40 minutes, 40, 50 minutes, you're kind of at the maximum uh, kind of total IBUs. And if anybody's looking at the slides later on, I say total IBUs, essentially, normally when you think of IBUs, it's more of a concentration, uh, but we kind of factored in, well, what's the actual volume of the beer? You know, because we were looking at the sample throughout, you know, over time, well, the volume of the beer at, 40 minutes is different than the volume of the beer at two hours. And so essentially what we did is we took the IBU concentration and then multiplied that by the volume of beer to get our kind of total IBUs. Uh -huh. So if, if that makes sense, you know, like a, a simple uh, illustration is if you had a two liters of 50 IBU beer, well, two times 50, you'd have 100 IBUs. Or if you had one liter of 50 IBU beer, you, in both cases, you'd have 50 total IBUs, even uh -huh. though the concentrations were very different. Hmm. So the the beer the beer might be getting more bitter over time, but just because there's more of a concentration of the uh, the isomerized alpha acids, right? Yeah, you're just concentrating it more, um, but you're not really making more iso alpha acids. So while the so while the beer may be more bitter, you're not getting better utilization of those hop materials. It's exactly. Just, it's just that there's more of them in that limited space. Right. Yeah. And. Uh, and there are there is a table in uh, in my PowerPoint that kind of you know describes you can kind of people can kind of read along with that a little bit and kind of see it's like oh well if you really look at the utilization it it doesn't look that you know different um, over time you know once you get to that uh, 
you know, kind of 40, 50 minute, the, the utilization is not as great. But if you actually looked at the hot, you know, the concentration, it's like, oh, at one minute, it's 26 IBUs at two hours at 66. That's huge. But really, the when you factor in the volume, the difference isn't that big over time. So what, what's your takeaway? I mean, what what effect does gravity have on hop utilization? So uh, so when we looked at our IBU results uh, for uh, the different hops, looking at different gravities, you know, first I looked at the data and it like, didn't look like it all lined up quite right. And I plotted it out a few different ways. And then I started to, to really see uh, a, a, a really linear trend uh, when I was kind of factoring in, you know, the actual concentrations of everything. Uh, and so what I was looking at is, okay, well, we know how many grams of hops we're adding, and we know the alpha acid concentration. So we can actually figure out how many milligrams of alpha acids are we adding to each beer. And so when we looked at that, we saw a really clear uh, linear trend that as, yeah, as the gravity um, in, increased, there was this kind of really steady linear decrease in the um, IBUs in the beer. Uh, and so we were actually able to plot this out and kind of uh, came up with a, a formula, and it's in the it's in the spreadsheet there. But um, I can kind of you know translate a little bit of it for your for your uh, listeners uh, to make it a little clearer. But essentially, I'll, I'll give you the number that's in the spreadsheet. But it's about 0. 0.0116. Uh, you know, kind of uh, is the number of the utilization uh, plus there's a little off factor. But what that means is for every 0. 0.0116 IBUs per milligram per liter of alpha acids, you get, um, I think I said that weird if you want to fix that in post, but uh, <laughs> for every increase in gravity, for every degree Plato increase in gravity, so about every four, about every four points if you're using um, uh, gravity points, uh, for every, you know, uh, you're seeing the utilization drop by 0. 0.0116 IBUs per milligram per liter. And I know that's a little convoluted if you're just listening to that. Uh, so I kind of I wrote out kind of a simplified version of it to kind of put it in units that might make sense to somebody brewing a batch of beer. So what that means, if you're brewing a five gallon batch of beer, that's about 23 liters, uh, if I did my math right. Uh, and so one ounce of 10 percent alpha acid hops is actually about 2.83 grams of alpha acids. Uh, it's 28.3 grams of hops times 10 percent. Um, so that's 2,830 milligrams. And if you divide that by the volume, which was 23 liters, your beer would have 122 milligrams of alpha acids per liter if they all went into the into the wort. So that's kind of your theoretical maximum uh, of using one ounce of those hops in a five-gallon batch of beer. So theoretically, if you got all those converted, you'd have 122 uh, IBUs in your beer. Now, from our experimentation, uh, you know, depending on, on the um, gravity of your beer, you'd see different things. So if we were doing uh, a five Plato beer or 1020, we would actually see about 57 IBUs from that word. If we were doing a 10 Plato beer, it would drop by seven IBUs. Hmm. That'd be down to about 50 IBUs. And then a 15 Plato beer would be about 43 IBUs. And a 20 Plato beer would be about 36 IBUs. So when you're looking at a beer that's going from 1020 to 1080, the same amount of hops, you're looking at a difference of over 20 IBUs. Uh, so... And if you look at the Tinseth model, it's, it's not that far off from what we're looking at. Uh, the numbers were a little bit different there. They kind of started a little bit lower. Uh, and, the decrease, and the increase uh, or sorry, the decrease in IBUs wasn't quite as great. But I think when I plugged in some numbers for a similar beer, uh, it was coming out to maybe a decrease of about 17 or 18 IBUs. And so we saw a 21 IBU uh, difference in our work. Uh, so I, I think it does show that the Tinseth formula, uh, while it's not perfect, uh, if people are using it to kind of, you know, do some of these kind of rough approximations, they're probably not too far off from the truth uh, if they figure things out. Uh, but the thing to keep in mind, too, is we're looking at the wort IBUs. And mm. so, uh, the, and I'm not, and I tried actually, uh, you know, talking to some people about it that know about the Tinsley formula. And uh, you know, it's unclear if that work was done to wort or to actually a fermented beer. Uh, because for those people that have tested uh, wort, uh, the IBUs in wort are always going to be higher than the IBUs in the finished beer. So if you take a sample of your beer before you add yeast and send it out to be analyzed, and then you ferment it and send it to be analyzed, you're going to get two different numbers. Uh, because the yeast in the fermentation process, I talked earlier about how yeast binds to proteins. 
Well, the yeast is probably also binding to some of these hop compounds. And so the yeast is actually reducing the bitterness in most beers. Uh, and if you look at some of my data, in some of the cases, you know, in the wort, we're getting 140 IBUs. You never see 140 IBUs in a finished beer. Mm-hmm. You know, the most you're ever going to see is maybe 100. Uh, and so, you know, the yeast are known to probably take out, in some cases, you know, more than 30 percent of those IBUs. Uh, so that's a, a thing to keep in mind when you're looking at these numbers or other people that are testing, um, you know, the wort is you're going to see much higher numbers with that than, than you might expect initially. Now, so so if you're if you if you're brewing a big old thick beer, put more mm-hmm. hops in. <laughs> Which you know most people have that that general idea, but the idea is we want to be able to come up with a way to say, okay, if if you want to get the same you know number of IBUs, uh, you know how much more do you really need? You know if you uh, if you really love the uh, a pale ale that you've made, and you're like you know let me you know amp this up and make a double I, double IPA out of it. So let me you know double almost everything in there. Well, for the bitterness you're probably going to have to more than double, you know, your hops to get kind of the same level there, at least if you're looking just at the bitterness part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously, uh, the some of the other work we did on temperature is going to play into that a little bit. Uh, but, you know, we want to kind of come up with a way to say, you know, can we really, you know, get these numbers uh, down and figure out what's going on so that people can be more predictive? And uh, our hope is that, you know, we can verify some of this stuff in the next uh, several in the next year hopefully um, and maybe actually uh, get this published in an academic journal uh, and you know maybe share that and you know kind of come up with uh, and there's a lot of people coming up with some modified versions of the tens of formula in that uh, I've seen some that really uh, recommend you know uh, drops over time in the IBUs and I don't think that's really happening at up to two hours I don't think we're really seeing de- uh, degradation of IBUs at that point but uh, but if we, you know, kind of, you know, look ahead, you know, can we come up with a way to either either improve the tens of formula or come with a new formula really using, you know, hot pellets or, you know, how are and we don't know this yet. But, you know, how are some of these new cryo hops and how are all these things kind of playing into the bitterness um, game? Because and especially as we look at New England IPAs and late hopping, you know, how many, you know, how many IBUs do you get from a five minute boil uh, or from just steeping? And so that's kind of one of the other questions we were trying to look at this time. Yeah, are we going to see a Hamilton formula out there? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe someday we'll we'll have to see how. Uh, <laughs> if we can repeat the work, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to. Uh, you know, once uh, I mean, obviously this has all been repeated, but once we do some of the filtration stuff, uh, once we do a, a little bit more with the temperature analysis, uh, you know, I'm uh, and if if you know if I have enough to get it published in Academic Journal, I'll do that first, and then I uh, can put the data online for people to kind of you know play around with themselves, and maybe we can come up with. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I told my student who did the work that I have to give him at least half the credit become the formula. So it had to be the Hamilton Huffman formula. Uh, <laughs> it's starting to sound like a comet or an asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, you know my frustration with the the IBU formulas. You know the the well, my beard. You know, I used Tenseth and it and and my IPA didn't uh, fit in the style guideline, so I switched over to Daniels and it fit just fine. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, if people are consistent with what they're using, knowing your system, I mean, I think one of the problems with the Tins of Formula 2 is intentionally when, when Glenn Tinsley came up with it, he put in some adjustment factors for people's own systems. And if you use a lot of these websites, they don't have the default way to change these numbers around. Mm. So you're kind of stuck with kind of the default. I mean, one thing that bothers me with some of these formulas is they have, oh, click a button for hop cones or hop pellets. And there's a different number. Well, he never did any work with hot pellets. And actually, uh, so all the number of hot pellets, people say, oh, they're about 10 to 15 percent more. And uh, when I started this work, I kind of just looked online and plugged in the exact same recipe into about eight different IBU calculators using the so-called tins of formula. And I got seven different answers from eight different calculators. <laughs> so if you're using a calculator, uh, just stick with one uh, and, you know, evaluate your beers. And if you brew a beer, you want it more bitter, you know, you know, increase your hops that way. Uh, <laughs> what, you know, can, can at least tell you, you know, if, you, if you're kind of, you know, using, you know, what we found with the gravity that, it, you know, at least we can say with hot pellets, we kind of pretty much have a pretty good idea of what's going on uh, there. Now, uh, there is a related issue that we're still trying to work out is, okay, we see a decrease in gravity. Why, why does hopulization decrease with gravity? Uh, it's kind of, uh, and actually, 
Uh, some people are big proponents of it's the protein in the beer. And some people are big proponents of it's the sugar in the beer. And some people say it's both. Uh, and, you know, I say that's a great idea for another set of experiments. Um, and so that's probably what one of the things we're going to try to work on next summer is can we nail that down? Is it both? Is it really the protein? Uh, you know, if I had to, to lean in one direction or another, I'd say it's probably the protein. Uh, but, you know, it, uh, I know Glenn Tinzik is, is a big proponent of it being more sugar. Uh, that's kind of what he based his model off of. So, could, uh, could it just oh, be a saturation factor? I mean, just there's just so much stuff in the in the liquid at some point, you, it can't hold much more. I mean, certainly there can be to some extent, but you're looking at saturation of sugar or protein compared to uh, already something that's just at the part per million level. So it's probably it could it be playing a role. It could be, but I don't think that would be a, a, a huge role um, in it. Just at the concentrations you're you're looking at, because obviously. You know, I, IBUs are basically like a parts per million. So, you know, 50 parts per million versus 45 parts per million solubility wise isn't that huge of a difference. Uh, so could it be playing a role? It, it could. I don't really know. But uh, I think hopefully if we do the experimentation, we'll be able to, to really you know come up with a real answer. It won't be just a bunch of people waving their hands saying, oh, it must be this. It must be that. So. <laughs> It's like my sister's sweet tea. She puts so much sugar in it that if she added, you know, one more grain, it would crystallize. And <laughs> I need to take a gravity on my uh, sister's uh, sweet tea. Yeah, put too much ice in a solid block. Yeah. <laughs> now, you also talked about uh, now in this day and age where everybody is, is brewing beers and, and not putting them in the boil and putting hops in the boil, but wait until after the flame out and putting, you know, there's talk about, you know, throwing the the uh, uh, IBU calculation formulas for a, for a loop. Uh, you know, somebody asked me uh, online on one of my videos I posted, they said, well, I want to make one of these beers. How do I figure out the bitterness? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Just put, put the exact number of hops I did, and it tastes pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so so you did it, what, your other segment of the, of the test mm -hmm. was uh, looking at uh, – the effect that uh, basically hop stands at different temperatures right. uh, have on IBUs. Yeah. So essentially our setup for the experiment was very similar to what we did for the gravity work, except uh, we just stuck with one gravity of the beer. Uh, we kind of followed the same recipe we did for our 10 Plato beer, but we didn't actually boil it for two hours. We kind of just boiled it for a few minutes with no hops in it. Um, got it to a boil, and then we reduced the temperature. And so uh, we made uh, we did it at 70 degrees Celsius, 80 degrees Celsius, and 90 degrees Celsius. Uh, so if you're stuck on Fahrenheit, you can do your own conversions. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, 70, so, 70 would be about 160, 80 would be about 180, 90 is around, what, 195? Yeah, that and, sounds about right. And then 100 is boiling. Right, 100 is boiling, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Depending so, on your altitude. <laughs> right. And, you know, for every for every 10 degree drop in, cel in Celsius, it's an 18 degree drop in Fahrenheit, if you want to do the math that way. Um, so we're looking at a difference of 18 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius uh, in each of these beers. And uh, again, if you for those of you that look, look at the slides that James posting um, from my presentation, I put you know the 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 boiled kind of uh, wort data along with all the lower temperature data, so you can kind of see. And again, we saw very quick increases in IBUs, even at, at minute number one uh, in these beers. We're seeing significant IBUs, and so with the hop stand beers, it's not different. Uh, we still saw uh, in in all of the reduced temperature uh, worts, uh, like the hop stand beers, we saw um, IBUs. Now the numbers, you know, kind of at one to five minutes are probably for you know there was uh we're all about half of what we saw in the boiled beer uh but interestingly if you know that the data uh looking at it initially the 90 degree was a little bit higher than the 80 the 80 was a little bit higher than the 70 for maybe the first five to ten minutes but after that really the difference between temperature for ibu is between 70 degrees celsius and 90 degrees celsius wasn't that big and there you know there's some air and fluctuation um, and I did post error bars on there, too. Uh, so you can see that, you know, uh, really, it's hard to tease out exactly, you know, why are we not seeing a big difference? You know, the temperature, uh, the 70 and the 90 aren't that far apart. And when you add in the the error and our averages, uh, you know, all of them look to be really close to the same. And I think 
from what I've heard from some people that have brewed a lot of these hop stand beers, they haven't really noticed that big of a flavor difference between, say, doing 70 and 90 degrees Celsius. But is the flavor, the aroma, some people say they can't, some people say they can tell the difference between 10 degrees. If it's, you know, 180 degrees Fahrenheit and or versus 160, they can tell the difference. Uh, but I think there's, it's complicated because obviously at those uh, points, there's different things going on with the proteins. There's different things going on with the essential oils that are in the hops. Um, but uh, it, it was clear that really the bitterness is uh, with with you know the the lower temperatures was about kind of half of what we saw uh, up to about 20 minutes. Uh, so if we did a 20 minute hop stand, uh, comparing that to say 100 degrees Celsius boiling wort, it was about half of that. But we did extend some of these for up to 40 minutes. And if we did the 40 minute hop stand, in some cases, you know, uh, again there's some error bars in there, but we're approaching. In some cases, 70 to 80 percent of the IBUs that we see in, in, in boiled uh, wort hmm. uh, in these. Now, again, we're looking at IBUs. Uh, I should be uh, clear note that IBUs doesn't always mean isoalpha acids. And I think uh, what we might actually be seeing in some of these beers, while the IBUs are the same, and I think it's still useful to use that, is we might be looking at more alpha acids dissolved in the beer. And we might be seeing some oxidized uh, alpha acids, which are an area of a lot of interest right now, too, uh, because they're known to uh, add bitterness to the beer. And if you're actually oxidizing those alpha acids, uh, they're going to be picked up by the, um, uh, by the IBU analysis as well. Uh, and so they may... You might have the same number of IBUs, but the perceived bitterness might actually be a little bit lower. And that does kind of fit in with what people are seeing with some of these New England and hazy IPAs is that, you know, the amount of hops they add and the bitterness aren't quite the same as you get from a kind of kind of standard West Coast type IPA. And so, uh, you know, again, it's still an area where I think we need to do more research. I think looking at filtration of some of these uh, words might uh, uh, help explain some of that. And uh, one thing that I think uh, really needs to be done is really doing the full-on analytical analysis, doing uh, all the separation and separating out by a method called HPLC, uh, looking at how many actual iso-alpha acids, how many oxidized alpha acids, how many alpha acids, how many beta acids are you really getting into there? So getting into some kind of really more serious chemistry to kind of answer those questions. Uh, but I think looking at just these IBU t uh, analyses uh, definitely tells us that, you know, that you don't need to be boiling your work to can get IBUs. Hmm. You know, for the top stands, we really, you really are getting IBUs out of these hop stands. And, you know, if, if people wanted, you know, a general rule of thumb, you know, I would say that about a 20 minute hop stand is going to give you somewhere around, you know, 60 to 70% of the IBUs you get from boiling. And that's a lot more. And like, if you look at the tins of the formula, it counts at a zero. Uh, I think I know some of the software out there. I know Beersmith does this. We'll kind of calculate in a hop stand IBUs for you. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what formula he's using to do that, but uh, you know, I, I think that it's definitely an area where we can kind of improve some of these formulas and and hopefully make things a little bit more predictable uh, for brewers if they're trying to do this. You know, if you want to change up your hops, you know, uh, or is it really the um, essential oils you care about, you know, do you want to just throw in a ton of mosaic because it smells great? Um, or do you want to be a little bit more careful about, you know, that do you want to try to use some cryo hops because maybe it adds less hop matter um, or things like that. So I think it, you know, the, the great thing about it is it gives a lot of reasons to do more experiments, which as a scientist is a, a, is a good thing. And as a beer drinker, uh, I think it's exactly. a good thing too. <laughs> <laughs> Steve and I did a, 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 a little, uh, uh, experiment, a sensory experiment. We don't have fancy equipment like you and, and lab assistants, uh, but we <laughs> we did a hop stand experiment where I did uh, extract beers with hops added at, uh, you know, three different temperatures. I think it was like 200, uh, 180, and 160 maybe. Um, mm -hmm. And we did uh, perceive a difference and, and those were those were hop stands at thirty minutes, and we right. we did perceive a distance uh, or a difference in the character of those beers. Uh, so, do you, are you saying that it, it, total IBU is a number that measures a certain quantity of of hop stuff that's in the beer, but uh, depending on the temperature that you steep, uh, you may get different characteristics of that hop stuff. In other, in other words, some of it might be more isomerized than at other temperatures, uh, and you might get more perceived bitterness as opposed to, uh, you know, more hop flavor or aroma or such as that. 
Yeah, I think that's that's the big thing, at least. Uh, you know, it, it, if you're comparing, you know, 90 degrees to 70 degrees, you're probably getting more ISO alpha axis from the 90 degrees. But in both cases, you're still getting an increase in the IBUs. Uh, so what the other hop stuff is, you know, is it oxidized alpha acids? Is it just the regular alpha acids? Uh, you know, it's all playing a role in bitterness, but the, the ISO alpha acid is the one that's kind of the most perceived bitterness. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that we're kind of, you know, at 70, maybe where it's really good at extracting alpha acids and not converting them. And so we're seeing more of those in the beer. And that does, you know, fit along with some of the dry hopping experiment data that I've seen um, from others that kind of, you know, fits with that, that idea that, you know, there's, the IBU is really complicated. And there's some people uh, in, in the beer chemistry area that, you know, sort of everybody uses the, the IBU bitterness unit, but no, they don't really love it, uh, but it's still a useful tool. And so kind of on figuring out how can we really, you know, do this and, you know, how useful is the IBU? Uh, and that's one of the other questions where, you know, if we can actually figure out the exact number of iso alpha acids, you know, that would tell us a certain story, uh, but it doesn't tell the whole story about bitterness. Uh, so you know, kind of figuring out an easy way to do that could make somebody a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the, the IBU test that, you know, we do is, I mean, it's, I don't remember when exactly when it was uh, determined, but, you know, essentially you're extracting the iso alpha acids along with other compounds out of the beer, or out of the wort. And, you know, the, the technology behind some of that is, you know, 40, 50 years old uh, that we're doing now. And they're, you know, it's based on methods that weren't that different that go back even farther. So, it's, it's a really useful technique, but also, you know, it's one of these where, you know, you, you can't tease out just one thing very easily. You're looking at three or four things um, that are there. Even if one of them is the most important thing, you know, the iso alpha acid, well, maybe in a regular beer, only 85% of the IBUs are from iso alpha acids. The other 15% are from other things. Uh, and in these hop stand beers, it could be very different. It could be you know, uh, in a boiled beer, maybe, you know, it's 85 percent, but in a hop stand beer, maybe the IBUs are only 40 percent from iso alpha acids or 50 percent. Uh, and so that's kind of one of those kind of really interesting questions and in looking at the perceived bitterness. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of you're getting to the point where, you know, the, the science, uh, the science side of beer and the art form of beer sort of, you know, collide. And we we just both say, I don't care as long as it tastes good. Uh, <laughs> And and adding into the uh, to the mix, you have uh, you know I've brewed hop stand beers where I use my electric system to maintain a certain temperature that I've picked over a certain amount of time and it's rock steady. And then mm -hmm. I've also just uh, you know brought the beer up to the boil, turned off the heat, threw in the hops, and then you know let the the natural you know mm -hmm. cooling curve happen at whatever the ambient temperature you know around it influenced so mm -hmm. you know that's an added uh, variable that you've got to put in there yeah and you know i can say you know when i brew beers at home i'm not quite as analytical with everything and you know i, I actually did a beer myself that way uh kind of did a impromptu kind of hazy beer i didn't actually even i was inspired by some of your cereal beers i didn't want to go crazy blueberry or anything uh <laughs> but i was like i really want to do a cream ale but i didn't you know it's like oh i go to the store and buy grits and i'm like oh but then i gotta cook them and do all that it's like i know i'll buy cornflakes and so i bought cornflakes and rice krispies and you know did a big you know mash with all those in there and then kind of just you know it was a small batch you know kind of a one and a half gallon beer and then just kind of you know uh, instead of you know, didn't monitoring the temperature, I just kind of stopped the boil, threw in a bunch of hops, and just let it sit until it you know till the next day till it cooled down, and then you know racked it over, and you know it was one of the most delicious uh, IPAs ever made. So wow, uh, <laughs> there you go. Could never repeat that, but you know. <laughs> now, now let me ask you a question. Uh, looking at the data, and you know you as a brewer. You know, you have to wear both your brewer and and scientist hats here. Mm -hmm. uh, but looking at your data, and I know that you've you've told me that you need to collect more to to you know be more precise. But what's 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 a good time length for a hop stand? You know, you know looking, you know, I, I can't say exactly. You know, what's going to get more of the you know uh, essential oils out? You know, if you're looking at you know bitterness. You know, really 20 to 30 minutes seems to be fine. Uh, and so I would, you know, that's what I would kind of, you know, shoot for if I was trying to do that and cool it down more. Um, I've definitely done some, you know, bigger beers where I want to, 
do some light hopping or some hop stands and you know i'll, I'll you know I'll, I'll reduce the temperature a little bit and let it stand for 20 to 30 minutes i've had good results there with good tasting beers um you know it's hard to say are you gonna you know at a certain point you're not going to get much more out of it so uh you know could you get more out of it by letting it go for two or three hours you know maybe um, I don't know any commercial breweries that are doing that. You know, some of them are doing whirlpools. You know, unless it's a huge system, they're probably not looking at much more than forty-five minutes. So, uh, I, I think really, you know, you're going to get a lot out of twenty, maybe a little bit more out of thirty. But after that, I don't think you're going to get too much more out of it. Yeah, are you are you going to be risking uh, degrading some of the, you know, the more delicate, volatile compounds that you want to keep? That's the question. Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's that balance, and so certainly longer at, at a higher, you know, if you're doing just a little bit lower, like a, like 90 degrees Celsius, you probably are losing some of that. You know, I I always love when I like walk into my my little brewing room in the basement, uh, and I can smell the fermenting beer, and it smells great. But then it also makes me sad because I'm like, it smells great because all that's leaving the beer. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> we need a uh, rebreather, right? So. <laughs> We need a system to take those those particles out of the out of the CO two that's uh, that's coming out yeah. and put them back in the beer. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it is it is happy and sad that occasion when right. you smell the beer and it's like, wow, that smells really good, and then oh, it's not going to be that's not going to be in the beer that's gone. Yeah, that's that's, that's just that, like that's just like potpourri for the guest bathroom here. <laughs> that's what <laughs> a lot better than potpourri anyway. <laughs> It's it's hoppery. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got to market that now. You give me a great idea. Hoppery. So, hop, hop, <laughs> Somebody's run to the run to the uh, the the website for registering trademarks right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot to there's a lot uh, a lot more questions I'm sure will will arise. And are you game for answering them from listeners? Uh, I will try. You know, they can certainly uh, email you, and you can forward them on my on my way. Or, you know, if they're they're if they have good Google foo skills, they can probably find me online uh, and get to me that way as well. Oh, but I, I want to be put in the loop. I want right. to be. Anybody, then, then I want, email James. Yeah, I want to be a fly on the wall to see what the questions are and and uh, you know what your answers are. Uh, but. Uh, Awesome. This has been fun. It's been fun to get back together, and I I, yeah. I can't wait to to uh, see what you do next. Yes, and hopefully it won't be. I, mean, I think it's uh, as many years until next time. So. Yeah. Amen. Well, the the line's always open. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Oh, you're very welcome, James. It was great talking with you. Well, thanks again to Chris. Very interesting results. Seems like brewing is evolving so quickly that it's outpacing the science. It's a good thing Chris Hamilton and Chris Huffman and others like him or them are uh, in the lab working to help us understand what's going on. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks, everybody, supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check all that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All-Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can find our logbooks where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all those out at basicbrewingshop.com. Also, take a look at our silicone pints. It's all until next time. Till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. 